Story recap here. Today, I'm going to explain an action and sci-fi film called Love, Death, and Robots Pop Squad. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. Rain falls on a squalid apartment as police cars hover by the entrance. Officer Briggs arrives just in time for his squad's raid to wrap up, walking past a colleague who's taking a man into custody. Before he's able to enter the wretched room, an officer scans his eye before moving away to let him in. Looking around the apartment, Briggs notices how unkept and pitiful the living conditions are. There's a pile of dirty dishes in the sink, the dining table is left to accumulate dust, and the floor is full of crumbs. While Briggs walks around, an officer questions one of the tenants, Ruth. He asks how long she's been living there, whether the landlords know they're living there, who else is helping her, and if there are any more families in the area. As the officer continues questioning her, Ruth proves to be uncooperative and pleads with them to stop. When the police remind her that what she's doing is legal, Ruth counters that they're not hurting anyone, they're just trying to live. Briggs sees moldy remnants of food, so he closes it back immediately. Just then, Pentel, Briggs' partner, exits from her room, escorting children out of it in an unfriendly manner as she shouts at them. Going up to Briggs, Pentel reports that that's all of them, mentioning that the kids have probably never seen the outside. Then, she observes that the parents made a bassinet out of a drawer. Thus, Briggs comments on the resourcefulness. Asking for the photos, Briggs checks the tablet that Pentel hands him, scanning through the pictures of the family. As he gives the tablet back to Pentel, Briggs tells her to go ahead while he deals with the kids. With that, the officers take Ruth away as she continues to plead for her innocence, continuing to persuade them that they're not doing anything wrong but merely trying to live. When that doesn't work, Ruth reminds Briggs that they're just children, pleading that they haven't even had breakfast yet, but the officer forcefully escorts her away. Closing the door, Pencil gives Briggs some privacy to do his job. Briggs turns around and looks at the children with a scrunched face, apologizing to them as he pulls out his gun. One little boy looks up at Briggs with his round eyes before holding up a stuffed dinosaur toy to him. Without a moment to hesitate, Briggs fires the gun at them. As Briggs drives with his flying car away from the rough neighborhood, he hears case reports on the police radio about other families with unregistered children needing to be dealt with. Briggs drives straight to a magnificent skyscraper over the city of the wealthy. In the grandiose building, Briggs' romantic partner, Alice, performs a vocal solo for a large crowd as she walks down a flight of stairs in a beautiful red gown. After her performance, Alice goes straight to Briggs, excited to see him because he's often busy and thought he wouldn't be able to watch her program. Briggs assures her that he wouldn't have missed her solo. Noticing his demeanor, Alice asks Briggs whether it was a bad day at work, so Briggs tells her it's just the usual routine of dealing with breeders, which was easy. Upon the topic of breeders, Alice finds it unrelatable how people can just stop taking their reju treatment and give up such a life of immense luxury. Alice adds that it took her 20 years to perfect her vocal solo, and not being allowed to bear children seems like a small price to pay for getting to live forever while preventing overpopulation. Briggs just gives her a lighthearted reply, that they can't invite more people to the party if no one ever leaves. Changing the topic, Alice reminds Briggs that she has her boost tomorrow and asks Briggs to drive her. After a few moments of thinking, Briggs agrees, saying Pencil can cover his shift. With that, Alice gives him a kiss, but Briggs suddenly opens up the topic of mortality again, telling Alice that if they weren't going to live forever, he'd marry her. Playing along with his statement, Alice tells him that if they weren't going to live forever, she'd let Briggs get her pregnant. When Briggs gets taken aback by her statement, Alice just laughs at his reaction, telling him not to be so serious. Just then, Alice gets taken away to interact with her audience, so Briggs claps for her. As he does, however, he notices small blood splatters on his hand. As his hands tremble, the blood reminds him of his work from earlier, where he shot the children after being offered the stuffed dinosaur. Meanwhile, at the party, Alice is getting praised for achieving the incredible feat of perfecting the vocal solo composed by some old man, thus earning her the title of Slayer of Dinosaurs. Just as Alice holds up a stuffed dinosaur toy in reference to the title, Briggs looks back to see it in her hand, haunted by what he'd done. The next day, during Alice's boost reju treatment, Briggs is still in deep thought when Alice checks up on him, asking if he's okay. He sits next to her in a spacious white room with large windows that give them a nice view of the clouds, waiting for her treatment to begin. Not wanting to ruin the day, Briggs just explains that he needs a little rest, so Alice makes him hold her hand. Just in time, Alice's boost treatment starts. She gasps in delight, looking up as her pupils start to dilate. Afterward, Alice basks in the glorious aftereffects of her reju treatment, saying she feels so good while Briggs drives back home. 
Though Briggs is trying to focus on driving, Alice climbs over from the passenger seat, getting all touchy-feely with Briggs. Taken aback, Briggs asks if she wants to get freaky in the car right now, so Alice says yes, reminding Briggs of what the Riju treatment makes her feel. Briggs tries to push her away, telling her to hang on, but Alice won't listen as she continues to stick close. In the back seat, Briggs's eyes catch sight of the stuffed dinosaur gift that Alice received for her performance. The memory makes him snap, so Briggs suddenly pushes her back on her seat. As Briggs apologizes, Alice asks in confusion if he's okay, so he says he can't do it right now. Leaning back in her seat, Alice mumbles that Briggs is such a bore. On another job call, Pencil tells Briggs that their recent suspect couldn't make their baby stop crying, hence the neighbors heard the baby. Finding it careless and ridiculous, Pencil wonders whether going off Riju makes the breeders stupid for thinking they can keep a noisy child a secret. As the recent suspect gets escorted outside, he catches sight of Briggs, calling him a child killer and murderer. Out of anger, the man pushes the officers away from him, taking one cop's gun and shooting directly at Briggs. Briggs is rooted in his spot as he stares at the man, not not even flinching when the bullet narrowly misses him by a hair, nearly cutting his cheek. Immediately, the suspect is repeatedly shot to take him down. Pencil checks on Briggs, pointing out that he nearly died. Still, Briggs doesn't respond as he looks at the dead suspect, conscience plaguing his mind. Back in his car, he continues to have flashbacks of the children with the dinosaur. Trying to regain his focus, Briggs checks on his wound from the rearview mirror but spots Alice's stuffed dinosaur in the back seat. This time, he checks the tag to see which torrent came from. Going straight to the collectibles shop, he sees the establishment full of toys, as well as the stuffed dinosaurs. While there, Briggs overhears the store clerk selling a train that's over 200 years old. When Briggs mentions that there must be a lot of buyers, the clerk tells him that there aren't many collectors for that sort of thing. Meanwhile, the buyer, Eve, takes the toy train and walks in a hurry, side-eyeing Briggs as she tries not to catch his attention. As he watches her, the clerk asks if Briggs wants to see more of the dinosaur stock, so he answers that he isn't a collector. Right away, Briggs follows Eve, who speeds away on a motorcycle, only to find her living in a rundown house on the outskirts of the city, surrounded by ruined buildings and overgrown greenery. Walking to the house, Briggs takes out his gun, only to see a toddler playing around while a joyful Eve washes the dishes, laughing at her child's antics. With the floorboards creaking under Briggs' steps, Eve notices his presence and immediately takes hold of the toddler, Melanie, protectively. Trying to reassure her, Briggs tells her to sit down as he does the same, placing the gun on the table. Saying he wants to talk, Briggs watches as Eve breastfeeds Melanie in front of him. Curious, Briggs asks why they do it, why breeders keep having children. With a steadfast attitude, Eve answers that it's because she's not so in love with herself that she'd want to keep living forever. Unconvinced, Briggs asks if Eve thinks that living under these conditions is living and if keeping it, the child, locked up is also living. Eve corrects him that the proper pronoun is her. When Eve sets Melanie down, the toddler immediately starts playing, making Briggs watch with a fond smile. Noticing his expression, Eve points out Briggs' smile, so he honestly answers that he thinks Melanie is cute. Upon pointing out Briggs' feelings, the officer is resolute, telling Eve that this sort of setup can't possibly work. Eve confesses that she's been alive for 218 years, and she's seen too much, but having Melanie makes everything new for her. Saying that she loves seeing things through Melanie's eyes, Eve points out that her child's eyes are so bright and full of life, very much unlike Briggs' dead ones. Eve continues to share her sentiments as they both watch over Melanie while she's playing. She recounts Melanie's first steps, first laugh, and the first time she called her mommy. With tears in her eyes, Eve tells him that she remembers all these moments because she knows she won't have many. When Melanie notices Briggs, she stands to walk toward the table, so Briggs pushes the gun away from the edge. Seeing the toddler gesture to reach for something, Eve tells Briggs that Melanie wants his hat, so Briggs hands it to the child. After getting the hat, Melanie holds it towards Briggs, but she pulls it away from his reach when Briggs tries to take it. Eve explains that Melanie wants to put it on his head because it's a game she plays. Briggs slightly bends down to let Melanie reach his head. Seeing the officer preoccupied, Eve takes the chance to swipe the gun from the table. Briggs reacts just in time to grab her hand and pin Eve on the table, knocking Melanie away in the process so the child cries. Briggs points the gun at Melanie, so Eve pleads for him not to shoot, reminding him that Melanie is merely a child. She bargains for Briggs to shoot her instead so her death can make room for Melanie in the population. But as Briggs looks at his gun, guilt washes over him. He lets go of Eve and walks away, allowing Eve to embrace her daughter. Outside, Briggs notices Pencil waiting just as Melanie's crying continues to be heard from their spot. 
Facing each other in a standoff, the two officers immediately draw their guns at each other at the same time. As Briggs' shot lands directly on Pencil's neck killing her, Briggs takes a hit on his chest. Still, Briggs walks out to the rain, dropping his gun along the way, with a content feeling of knowing that at that moment, he made the right choice. But soon, Briggs also succumbs to his injuries and falls on the grass. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.